guys welcome back to the channel is seven day adventist pastors causing a firestorm on social media that's after he preached a sermon entitled what check it out good reasons to be gay now if you know the seven day adventist church they have a doctrine on this one and a statement that they made look at what they said seven day adventists believe that sexual intimacy belongs only within the marital relationship of a man and a woman so why did pastor ron kelly Preach a sermon entitled, Good Reasons to be Gay. Good Reasons to be Gay. Number one, you were born that way. This has become the, uh, this has become the deceit du jour of our modern age. Now, several could not be at our Jesus and holistic sexuality. But I want to tell you right from the very beginning, when Dr. Julie Hamilton, a non-Seventh-day Adventist, PhD, licensed marriage and family therapist, stood behind this pulpit for her very first presentation in our leadership sessions, I have never listened to a Bible-believing Christian, a Bible-believing therapist, an academic say so many powerful, positive, encouraging, culture-defying things as this woman said. And if you miss that presentation, you have lost in the armor of God the sword that you need to defy the lie that you were born that way. She spent the first 15 minutes talking about what the Bible has to say about this. She didn't go straight to the latest science. She didn't draw on all of her life of experience only. She spent the first 15 minutes reminding all of us that no matter what the science says, the Bible is the touchstone of truth. And it is the, it is the illuminator of error. And every Christian that believes even slightly that the word of God is the boundary of light and darkness, the purveyor of truth and the illuminator of falseness ought to take the time to listen to what this lady said for she gave launching on a biblical foundation of truth. She gave probably the most plausible, logical and reasonable explanation for why people say I was born this way. Fortunately, it's on the web. You can watch it. But the absence of you watching it is the ignorance that contributes to our societal ills. And for us as Seventh-day Adventists to say, well, I don't like this subject. It's controversial. It's political. It's intimate. It's touchy. It's all those things. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You are exactly right. And I'm here to tell you today, since the Bible's full of stories dealing with morality and immorality, sorry, it's just possible since books like Song of Solomon exist and since perversions like the stories of Noah and so are there, they're written down. And some of the details are pretty unpleasant. Since those things exist, God might still want there to be a witness in the 21st century. And it might have to come through God's church because last I checked in my dialogue with someone who was upset about another subject matter I preached on that does have political discourse involved with it. The moral voice of society is not coming from the politicians, not unless they're personally Christian and moral in their inmost soul. The voice of conscience, the collective recalibrating of morality is to come from the pulpit, from the word of God, from the altar at home, from the teacher's desk in the school, but all from the word of God. When I read in 1 Corinthians 6, let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I read a list of the unrighteous that will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 9. It says, or do you not know? Now, if there was ever a church to mirror our modern day, it was the church in Corinth. Confused, ignorant, debauched, 
celebrating their supposed grace, which was license, liberty, and enslavement. If ever there was a book that was hard-hitting, heavy for the pastor to write, and maybe heavy for the preachers to preach, it's these two books. Paul will have to tell them in the beginning, by the way, and this would be good for the audience that tunes into Village. You say you're of Cephas? You say you're of Apollos? You say you're of Paul? Listen to me, audience that tunes in. Listen to me, audience here sitting in the pews. Paul will tell you, did any of these men die for you? Your allegiance is not to God through them. Your allegiance is straight to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not whether... Some well-spoken preacher says it or another one disagrees. You're going to stand before God. And he will go also on to say you're unconverted. You're babes. You're carnal. This is strong talk. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Righteousness and unrighteousness is a dynamic of biblical definitions heavenly judgment, and by God's grace, heavenly intervention to take a dark heart, a stony heart, and make it live, make it full of light. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, and by the way, those two things went hand in hand in Paul's day. It was a very should I say eye-opening experience when a few weeks ago I walked through the ark encounter and there on one of the three floors of the ark are the Old and New Testament temple prostitutes and all the men mulling around neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexual. So verse 9 is all sexual sin. Oh, you can be an idolater in a lot of ways, but in Paul's day, a lot of idolatry was wrapped up in sexual sin. Cultic prostitution. Heterosexual and homosexual. All of those things in that list appear to me to be things that you could be born with a proclivity towards. But whether you were born with a proclivity towards them or not, I have found in my life that falling into sin is as simple as falling out of bed. And it doesn't matter whether or not you can line up a legitimacy or an excuse or a reason that comes from the lineage that precedes you, the environment that nurtured you. These are all things that by God's grace, Jesus Christ has conquered, made provision for healing and hope and joy in the constructs of true relational married familial love. And he can set us free from glory. Hallelujah. But all of these things are as natural as the carnal heart moves towards its natural wrongness and depravity. Thieves, covetous, drunkards. I spent a fair amount of time in places in America where there is drunkenness and alcoholism at a rate that is absolutely discouraging and depressing. Revilers and swindlers, swindlers, It won't be a part of the new life, which means the divine medicine, the divine master of our soul, the divine healer, Jesus Christ, the divine warner, the gospel preaching of the prophetic voices of the parents and the teachers and the preachers. They are to call people to an awareness that the naturalness of sin which is so deeply rooted in our hearts, will not be allowed in to the supernatural restoration of the family made new through the one who bore it all to Calvary and has lifted us out of our depths and degradation from the uttermost to the guttermost. There's a God who said, I'm coming down, I'm lifting up, 
I'm delivering. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. No, it's not in the verse, but it's in his heart and in the spirit of our Lord. Whether I was born with a proclivity or whether I was nurtured through the dysfunction of our age and my home, the truth of the matter is, is that God gives us the power. Now, to someone that suggests that same-sex attraction is a choice, my deepest sympathies go out to you. If there's anything that we should learn from listening to the amazing testimonies of the men and women who have the compassion and the courage to stand behind this pulpit and say, praise God, glory, hallelujah, I am 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11. I've been washed. I've been sanctified. I've been justified in Jesus through the Holy Spirit's living in my heart. If there's anything that should break upon the corporate consciousness of God's church, it is this knowledge that to my understanding, nobody wakes up one day and says, hmm, I want to have same-sex attraction. There are all kinds of things that contribute to it. And the contribution of all those things is so vaguely understood by our society and people are so afraid that it might actually be discovered and unravel the lie. It's like the thread that would take the tapestry of the deception and completely unravel it, that they're slapping everybody's hands. And there's 26 states in the United States of America that won't even allow counselors to talk about it with people who think they want to be different. The circumstances that initiate and incubate and nurture this tendency are multiple and challenging. And the idea that somebody walks into this lifestyle like some man chooses to have an adulterous affair with somebody else's wife is a gross misunderstanding of the circumstances that surround this element of personal identity. And everybody here needs to understand this. This is not as simple as, well, I think I prefer boys over girls, men over women. If we as Christians could actually wrestle with the call to love, to listen, and not abandon our identity to holiness, to the word of God, we might actually be the head instead of the tail in the discussion that our societies lock themselves in and lock themselves down to around this circumstance, around this issue. Sober. I cannot say thank you enough to the men and women who have been willing to fly to this little bitty town in this little bitty out of the way place and talk to the thousands online and those that have sat in this auditorium and share the chapters of their life that they wrestled with for decades. The courage that Christ has put in their heart to help us all better understand that this is so far from being a simplistic problem that it's not funny. Again, listen to Dr. Julie Hamilton. Go back and listen to these testimonies. The truth of the matter is, there are lots of good reasons to be gay. They don't add up to a reason to live that way, and they don't add up to a, to a reason to be identified that way, and they don't add up to a reason to choose to live that way out. But we've listened to testimonies this very week about people who thought nothing could ever be any different in their mind. They couldn't reconstruct the identity of their sexual interest. But then at some moment, some little movement in their heart, some little step of obedience towards the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden at some moment in time, there is an awakening inside. Amen. Hallelujah is right. 
But I'm here to tell you, when Judith Wallerstein wrote her book, Divorce, A 25-Year Legacy, and she told us that the dynamics of divorce only multiply and grow through the life of the adult, let alone the child. Yes, reason number two to be gay is that probably you were shaped and natured that way. And whether it was a sensitive soul that determined it couldn't trust the same gender, whether it was defensive detachment or some other form of emotional detachment that made alignment with the emotional security of whatever gender you were of more safe, whether it was the absence of a man or a woman, whether it was the rejection of your biological identity by an adult that was locked down in their own dysfunction and addiction, we don't know. But we do know more than we used to know. And I want to share my affirmation again for those who have been willing to tell their family stories, their developmental stories. Number three, third good reason to be gay, not only were you potentially born with some proclivities that way? Not only were you nurtured by the dysfunction of our society, the breakup of the home, the absence of self-control in your mom or your dad, the victimization of some older brother or kid down the street, whether or not your sexuality was awakened prematurely in a same-sex encounter, all of these things add up to the multiple layers of confusion of person and society. But the third reason good reason to be gay is that our society is encouraging it left and right and they're telling you, you should just be yourself of course they have no awareness of a holy spirit that speaks individually to people they have no value for the word of god that actually con that actually directs and lays out the relational laws the mental health laws that could actually save us from ourselves i didn't preach here last sabbath because I was battling sickness. But I want to tell you, on Friday, as I'm just driving back and forth between places, I'm listening to national public radio, which really ought to be uh, the state religious news network to the new secular society we live in. I listen to it regularly because I, I, I'm trying to figure out what's truth and error. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening last Friday, and I, 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 I hear this one. Her state bans gender-affirming care for teenagers, so she travels 450 miles to get it. You know, Chloe Cole stood behind this pulpit, testifying in multiple, hundreds of places around the world, including our own United States Senate. And to see this 20-year-old stand up against the cult religion of transgenderism, and sexual expression, however you want to have it. The last question I asked her as she stood here on Monday night was, do you regret any of the price you've paid to stand up to this lie? And boy, did she, as it were, stiffen her little female spine and let us know that her heart has come alive to love in a way that it's never been alive before and she doesn't have the very first regret at 20 years old putting her face into the blighting, damning, scornful, hateful winds of those who once affirmed her as she mutilated her body. So I, I'm listening to this report from National Public Radio. But I've got lots of things to do and I'm moving around and I turn my car off and on different times. And finally, when I'm pulling in at about 625 to my home last Sabbath, last Friday, another one comes up. Why books, book bans have been so hard to stop? Well, you wouldn't have to take too many guesses to know why National Public Radio needs to place in its prime time a discussion about book bans because there just happens to be a number of parents out there who believe that certain things shouldn't be seen by certain little eyes until Maybe never, but certainly not when they're in the first, second, third, or fourth grade. And I'm saying to myself, why in one newscast do we have to have two segments 
on something this dark because they are believers and they are out to nurture and encourage every single person to the self-determined damnation of self to explore and discover what it is about them irregardless of anybody in society like Koi Cola said, seen that, been there, done that, don't go down that road, people change, you do grow up. There you have it. There's a lot of firestorm on the internet as to why he did that. But I guess at the end of it all now, you understand fully. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel for more videos like this. See you next time.